Okay, we continue our courses of uh, developing innovative idea for the money. Okay, style of innovation. When we think about innovation, we often think about product innovations, and that innovations are limited to features or functions. Well, that's correct in part. When we think about types of innovations, we want to challenge you to think beyond just the product. We want to think about business models, business model innovation. Dell did not invent the PC. They invented no part of the personal computer. But they invented this build-to-order model when Michael Dell was in his dorm room in the mid-'80s at the University of Texas. He thought that there was a market for individuals that wanted to choose what they wanted in their computer rather than being restricted to what was on the shelf at your local computer retailer. So business model innovations might be a great opportunity for you where you're not going to invent a new product, you're not going to innovate in the feature or the function of a new product, but how the pieces connect, how the business works, how customers and suppliers and partners may be interconnected. So there are business model innovations we're going to talk about within the course and that we encourage you to think about. There are marketing innovations. Nike's Air Jordan brand was largely unprecedented. Nike did not invent the shoe. Nike did not invent apparel. But they did do a large part to invent the celebrity sports endorser. And in 1984, when they signed Michael Jordan as Air Jordan, it was somewhat unprecedented for companies, and particularly apparel companies, to sign sports celebrities. Now, today it's common practice. But then, 30 years ago, it was rare. And it was seen as very risky. And Nike was still a small company. So when you signed a basketball player at the University of North Carolina that had never played yet in an NBA game, that was believed to have great potential, as many college athletes do, but was unproven. And to really quantify the level of risk that Nike took with that in their marketing innovation, they spent half of their marketing dollars for the year to sign Michael Jordan to an endorsement deal with Nike. Now, it's proven to be one of the greatest endorsement deals of all time for both Michael Jordan and Nike. It's proven to be one of the greatest brands of all time and that people are still buying Air Jordan products long after Michael Jordan is retired from professional basketball but at the time, tremendous risk, very innovative for Nike to recognize the potential of celebrity endorsement. And so you may have ideas that are going to be driven by marketing innovations, not a product innovation, but something you're going to do different to bring your product to market and to position your product or service in the market. Other types of innovations include organizational innovations, how you're going to organize. Avon did not invent cosmetics, but they were a leader in using a customer-based sales force where they weren't going to do what many of the other cosmetic retailers do, a build a store and sell within a store or sell to a large retailer and have the reliance on the Macy's or the other large retailers for their traffic. But they were going to equip individuals, and they were going to equip largely women, and largely women that were working part-time when Avon started, to be able to sell cosmetics to their friends and family, and a very direct customer-based sales force. Very innovative for its time. Process innovations. Netflix, doing mail-order movie rentals. Blockbuster, at the time, in the U.S., was the leader. It was, let me go to the video rental store and choose my movie. Netflix did not invent the movie. Netflix had no role at the time in the production of the movie. They were going to have a process innovation that let individuals mail order the product from a website. Now they're into streaming and they've continued to innovate, but when they first came to market, it was purely a mail order business, doing something different, doing something novel by process. There are other innovations. There are product innovations that are out there, so we don't want to forget about those. It's certainly encouraged and certainly advantageous, as you do have a new product idea, to bring that to market. Beyond product innovations, there are also service innovations. There's a company here in the U.S. called Zipcar. Zipcar does car rentals. They do car rentals differently than many of the other car rental companies out there that set up shop via a retail outlet or at the airport. What Zipcar does is they have a membership model. You can go online and become a Zipcar member. What's different about Zipcar, one, is that you rent by the hour. So you may pay 8 or $10 per hour as opposed to 30 or $40 per day. So if you only need the car for an hour, if you need to run to the grocery store, if you need to pick a friend up from the airport, you can do that very easily and very affordably. Zipcar also is novel in that they position their cars in a very distributed fashion. So here on campus, there are a few parking lots here and there where there's one zip car here and one zip car there. So they're distributed. So I can go online, I can go on my mobile device, and I can find a zip car that's near me, that I can walk to. If I live in an apartment building, there may be one in my garage. So in that way, what we see with zip car, no role in inventing the automobile, no role in inventing the car rental model, but they have been very novel in the service innovation of let's rent differently, let's position our cars in different places that are convenient to our customers, and let's have a service innovation that's going to be very novel for what's out there that better lies with what our customers' interests are. There are supply chain innovations. Alibaba is a company that we've heard a lot about in 2014 as they went public, one of the largest public offerings ever globally. But what they do is have a web-based supplier directory where they are disintermediating the supply chain and allowing individuals and businesses to find each other in a more easier fashion, in a more cost-effective fashion, and in a more global fashion. Now, as we've talked about Apple, and we talked about great product innovations that are out there, even Apple has had some failures, and this is one of those. The Apple Newton came to market in 1992 as a $700 device 
that you could use as a calculator, that you could use as a calendar, that you could use to take notes, and that you could use to catalog your contacts. 1992 was a pre-internet, pre-Wi-Fi, pre-smartphone era. So there were no music, no movie, no cell phone, no streaming, no app opportunities for the Apple Newt. It was rather large. You can see it in comparison here on the left-hand side to what the iPhone 4 currently is. So a big device, an expensive device, a rather limited device in its functionality. And what Apple found is that for what it did as a calculator, note taker, calendar, contacts management tool, it was not successful in the market. People were not willing to pay $700 for such a device. So even Apple fails sometimes. Dell brought to market a computer that was designed to be a combination of a laptop and a desktop. So what you see here is a device with a 20-inch screen, a device that is portable, a device that has a full-size keyboard, a device where the keyboard detaches from the rest of the device and connects wirelessly. So it lends itself to many of the aspects of a desktop and that we don't need to lean over our laptop to work on it. We can lean back in our office chair. We can detach the keyboard. We can have some space between ourselves and the computer monitor. We can have a large monitor at 20 inches. And we can have a desktop-like experience. It's also portable. And it's even portable without having a case. So what you see in the background is an expandable handle where the hinge that connects the screen to the CPU has a dual purpose as a handle. So it lends itself to mobility as well. You would think perhaps a great device, and it was a failure. It was 17 pounds, which is arguably two or three or four times the weight of your current laptop. It was $3,400, so $3,400 at its time. You could have bought a laptop and bought a desktop and had money left over. And what we found here is that even when it lent itself to being able to be portable with a handle, people were conditioned to put laptops in travel bags, which made it even more cumbersome and even more larger and even more heavier. And so what we find is that even Dell, which has had great success in bringing great product to market, tried to do perhaps too much. They tried to be a laptop and a desktop. And what they found was that they were unsuccessful in really doing either. $36.50, the retail price, taxes included in the U.S. once it was brought to market. We also want to think about innovation in the context of beyond technology. And it's surely not limited to technology products. What we see here is a Herman Miller Aeron chair. This was a product that was brought to market and it was in a climate where the existing chairs, the executive chairs, were a large, bulky, leather, heavy, unattractive banker's chair. So what Herman Miller brought was something that was an aesthetic chair that even won design awards based on the look, which brought tilt mechanisms and cradling and breathability and flexibility and customization and recyclability to market. This chair is not an inexpensive chair. If you buy the actual Herman Miller design chair and not one of the knockoffs that have come since then, it's close to $1,000 for a chair. Now, is $1,000 expensive? Well, it depends. If you compare it in its category, at its time, mm -hmm. to the banker's chair, the large leather high back wooden arm chairs, those were nearly $2,000. So when you think about bringing a product to market, don't purely look at the number and what's the price. Think about how does it compare to the market? What are the comparable products and services selling for? And how does yours compare there? So for a product that's near $1,000, when its competing offerings are near $2,000, there's a price advantage here as well. Google Glass is something that I saw for the first time when I was out at Google visiting them last year, and I saw Sergey Brin, University of Maryland graduate, with the president of Turkey, walking around the Google campus wearing the Google Glass. And so Google Glass at that time was not something that most people had heard of or were even familiar with, but it is something that we're beginning to see, beginning to see in different forms and fashions. It's still rare. It's still novel. We're not exactly sure what the ultimate success is going to be of it, but it's the type of thing that Google does, and Google does well, and they experiment and try new things. And in that way, when you're walking around such a campus, you're not surprised when you see such things pop up here and there. You can hear a little bit more about Google Glass and what some of the ambition and motivation was for it in Sergey Brink's TED Talk. So we encourage you to take a look at that and see and learn a bit more about what it is and what their vision is for it. So in summary, when we think about types of innovations, it can be products, but it can also be a variety of other innovations. It can be business models. It can be marketing innovations. It can be service innovations. It can be innovations in the supply chain and in other categories as well. So don't limit yourself just to thinking about product innovations. Think broadly, th think wildly, and think about what the market needs and what types of innovations might make sense for you as you're considering what you might like to launch. Okay. I'll cover another item in chat and save this issue. As we examine entrepreneurs and think about entrepreneurial mindset, we want to spend some time talking about strategic decisions. And so in this context, our objectives are to help think about fundamental elements of entrepreneurial decision-making, connect this element of cognition to entrepreneurship, and think about how to examine decision-making in the context of what are unique and significant tasks 
that entrepreneurs need to make as they are selecting and evaluating opportunities and ultimately building and growing their venture. So decision making is a cognitive process. And what we mean by cognitive is simply thinking that within the mind of the entrepreneur, there are various exercises and biases that we're going to talk about. We also want to recognize that decision making implies choice. There's always a choice. The choice to do nothing is still a choice. And we'll talk about what some elements are there as well. So with strategic decisions, this is not necessarily what color socks am I going to wear today or where might I have lunch today. It's something that's a bit more significant. We want to recognize a problem. We want to think about alternatives. We want to evaluate those alternatives. And we want to select the alternative that best satisfies our criteria, our evaluation criteria. Evaluation. We also want to recognize that the study of entrepreneurial decision making leads to better decisions and leads to better entrepreneurs. And so what we want to think about, too, in entrepreneurship is that the decisions that we make are different than what a typical company manager might make. We are operating as entrepreneurs with limited information. If we're doing something new, almost by definition, it hasn't been done many times before. So we don't necessarily have a lot of precedent to work from. We need to be action-oriented and decisive as we're working in new markets, as we're trying to take advantage of opportunities before others. We don't want to be idle. We don't want the window of opportunity to close on us. We also need to be perhaps more accepting of risk than a corporate manager. And we might involve major consequences. What we mean by major consequences is that we might only have the opportunity to try something once. We might not have the time or the budget to try the same thing a second, third, or fourth time. We might need to get it right fairly early on. And so in that context, what some of the consequences are of failure are a bit more significant or significantly more significant for entrepreneurs than for company managers. Decision making is also a strategic activity. We want to recognize that with entrepreneurship, we want to think about our goals. We want to think about if we're a for-profit venture, what are our revenue and profit goals? What's the market share opportunity that we're targeting? What are the product advantages that we are aiming for? And so I'm a big believer in setting goals. And by setting goals, it's going to do a lot for charting the path on how to get there. We also want to recognize that we want to be critical in our analysis. We want to think about the allocation of our resources and the allocation of our commitment and our relative priorities. Within strategic decision making, there are a variety of characteristics that play a role. One is complexity. We want to think about the facts and the figures and the contingencies. We need to think about the uncertainty elements. We need to think about the rationality of it and not to be geared purely by emotion in our decisions. And we want to think about the control element of what deliberate actions can we take to maximize our success as entrepreneurs. We want to think about the environment that we're operating in. If we look at this picture, this individual is walking up a flight of stairs. If we take a broader picture, if we take a broader perspective, if we reduce our tunnel vision and think about where does this individual truly sit, well, within this M.C. Escher drawing, he may be going up. He may be going down. He may be going left or right. When you look off to the right-hand side, you see trees growing to the right. When you look to the left-hand side, in the upper corner, trees are growing to the left. We're not sure which way we're going. And this is not uncommon for entrepreneurs at times. The environment is challenging. The environment is dynamic. The environment is changing as we progress and as we advance and as we start marching in one direction. Our customers, our competitors, our markets, our governments, our regulations may all be going in different directions. And so it's important for entrepreneurs to recognize that and to think critically and to have a big picture view of things. So a uniquely challenging and changing environment means that we are, again, doing new things. We're without the resources and relationships that established companies may have. We have high levels of complexity, and we want to think about the consequences that come to bear. So in summary, we hope to have provide some tools and techniques to deal with some of these challenges within this course. We want to recognize that entrepreneurs are working in environments that are changing, and that with opportunity discovery, that's a central piece of where to start. That decision making is unique. Decision making is a significant task of entrepreneurs. We want to spend some time thinking about the motivations, thinking about the behaviors, thinking about the mindset of the entrepreneur and how to make smart decisions. And that's going to be the starting point for your journey into entrepreneurship. As we introduce the Opportunity Analysis Canvas, there are three key elements that we have as far as our goals for the canvas in the course. One, we'd like to expand and enhance your entrepreneurial mindset. We'd like to help you develop your opportunity analysis skill sets. And we'd like to help you identify or validate entrepreneurial opportunities, the business concepts that you may already have or that you can develop as part of our course and part of our specialization. Where does this sit? Well, we used to teach the business plan 10 years ago as the first course in entrepreneurship. We found that it was often a book of fairy tales. It was often a book of guessing of what might be, who might be the customer, what might be the market, what might be the financials. What we found in 2010 was this business model canvas approach, and we've integrated that as a precursor to the business plan to answer some critical questions of value propositions, of customer segments. What are the key partners and activities and resources that I need to bring to bear? What are some of the expenses? What are some of the revenue streams that I need to define before I can really write a solid business plan? Well, the Opportunity Analysis Canvas is designed to fit before the business model canvas. The Opportunity Analysis Canvas begins with trying to help you understand yourself, understand the entrepreneurial mindset, understand entrepreneurial motivation, understand entrepreneurial behaviors really baselining where you are and thinking about how to expand and enhance those. And by first being better entrepreneurs, we can be better equipped to pursue new venture opportunities. 
with the canvas, we also take a look at industries and think about industries that interest you and how do you analyze industries and their conditions and status. We look at macroeconomic factors, the demographics, the psychographics, the technology and societal and political and regulatory changes afoot. We'll examine competition. We'll think about how to develop value for your customers and value innovation. And then lastly, we'll focus on opportunity identification. So this is the path and essentially our blueprint for the remainder of our course. In our follow-on course in Innovation for Entrepreneurs, we'll dig more into innovation and how to commercialize your opportunities. And within our subsequent course on new venture financing, that will move more towards the business plan that we'll do within our final course in the specialization. So when we think about the canvas, it's really segmented into three areas. First, in thinking entrepreneurially, then seeing entrepreneurially, and then lastly, in acting entrepreneurially. So in summary, we want to recognize that business models take shape after an idea is conceived. That without the idea, there's no business model. There's no customer discovery. There's no business. That we need a solid idea to start with. And so it's this first step, this initial step, an idea generation that the opportunity analysis canvas fulfills. We start with helping you really understand yourself and understand those elements of entrepreneurial mindset, motivation, and behavior. And then we begin to march down the path of thinking about industries, of thinking about markets, of thinking about value innovation, and of identifying some entrepreneurial opportunities. Slide. Yeah. Yeah, no. Man, it's such a brief entrepreneur called entrepreneurship. Two, what a common motivator for entrepreneurs to start new venture. Trap for the trap moment range. I'm not sure. Anyway, they important to change the kingdom to create new thing. Anyway, they important to oh, innovation must be radical and disruption in order to be viable for the population. Not even at the Age of the way in a simple of this type of nation. Business model innovation. Market. Marketing innovation. What make a decision? What make a decision strategy? Require innovation question. Involve. Learning action in an instant day and education. Strategy. Strategy. Result in some more. Um, requires a significant allocation of pressure. Duration is convenient. The opportunity information to help in develop new area acting thinking of the new scene and the strategy decision to share or Strategy decision to consider lesson from recognizing the whole situation to So innovation must be and for okay. Must be the innovation have to radical and disruptive. What does it mean? To be we have a new innovation. Yeah. I 
garbage brought to you. So we need to check again. <laughs> the video. In the slide. Correctly. So I just want to everything for market innovation. So I should have this one but the opportunity such a canva. As we introduce the Opportunity Analysis Canvas, there are three key elements that we have as far as our... No, we're not going to be able to give them this opportunity to identify acting, saying, thinking, and um, thinking. Our goals for the Canvas in the course. One, we'd like to expand and enhance your entrepreneurial mindset. We'd like to help you develop your Opportunity Analysis skill sets. And we'd like to help you identify or validate entrepreneurial opportunities, the business concepts that you may already have or that you can develop as part of our course and part of our specialization. Where does this sit? Well, we used to teach the business plan 10 years ago as the first course in entrepreneurship. We found that it was often a book of fairy tales. It was often a book of guessing of what might be, who might be the customer, what might be the market, what might be the financials. What we found in 2010 was this business model canvas approach, and we've integrated that as a precursor to the business plan to answer some critical questions of value propositions, of customer segments. What are the key partners and activities and resources that I need to bring to bear? What are some of the expenses? What are some of the revenue streams that I need to define before I can really write a solid business plan? Well, the Opportunity Analysis Canvas is designed to fit before the business model canvas. The Opportunity Analysis Canvas begins with trying to help you understand yourself, understand the entrepreneurial mindset, understand yes, entrepreneurial motivation, understand entrepreneurial behaviors really baselining where you are and thinking about how to expand and enhance those. And by first being better entrepreneurs, we can be better equipped to pursue new venture opportunities. With the Canvas, we also take a look at industries and think about industries of interest to you and how do you analyze industries and their conditions and status. There's one of the goal and then for strategy decision for here. As we examine entrepreneurs and think about entrepreneurial mindset, we want to spend some time talking about strategic decisions. And so in this context, our objectives are to help think about fundamental elements of entrepreneurial decision making, connect this element of cognition to entrepreneurship, and think about how to examine decision making in the context of what are unique and significant tasks that entrepreneurs need to make as they are selecting and evaluating opportunities and ultimately building and growing their venture. So decision making is a cognitive process. And what we mean by cognitive is simply thinking that within the mind of the entrepreneur, there are various exercises and biases that we're going to talk about we also want to recognize that decision making implies choice. There's always a choice. The choice to do nothing is still a choice. And we'll talk about what some elements are there as well. So with strategic decisions, this is not necessarily what color socks am I going to wear today or where might I have lunch today. It's something that's a bit more significant. We want recognizing problem, recognizing, yes. Okay. We want to recognize a problem. We want to think about alternative. Better way, better way alternative, better way alternative. We want to evaluate those alternatives. And we evaluate. We want to select the alternative that best satisfies our criteria, our evaluation criteria. We also want to recognize that the study of entrepreneurial decision making leads to better decisions and leads to better entrepreneurs. And so what we want to think about too in entrepreneurship is that the decisions that we what make a decision strategy we make are different than what we also want to recognize that decision making implies choice. There's always a choice. The choice to do nothing is still a choice. And we'll talk about what some elements are there as well. So with strategic awareness of evaluation making 
leads to better decisions and leads to better entrepreneurs. And so what we want to think about too, when people come, if we're doing so, we don't necessarily have a lot as we're working at, we don't want to be more accepting of rare consequences. What we mean by major consequences might not have third or fourth time consequence for our strategic activity. We want to recognize that with entrepreneurship, we want to think about our goals. We want to think about if we're a for-profit venture, what are our revenue and profit goals what's the market share opportunity that we're targeting what are the product advantages that we are aiming for and so i'm a big believer in setting goals and by setting goals it's going to do a lot for charting the path on how to get there we also want to recognize that we want to be critical in our analysis we want to critical analysis critical analysis we should make money company can make money Think about the allocation of our resources and the allocation of our commitment and our relative priorities. Within strategic decision making, there are a variety of characteristics that play a role. One is complexity. We want to think about the facts and the figures and the contingencies. We need to think about the uncertainty. uncertainty. Elements. We need to think about the rationality of it and not to be geared purely by emotion in our decisions. And we want to think about the control element of what deliberate actions can we take to maximize our success as entrepreneurs. We want to think about the environment that we're operating in. If we look at this. Okay. Voila. Okay. Okay, we will continue.